Welcome to this webinar hosted by Tim Lizzy. This webinar is Understanding Your Stitch Regulator. And when I set up some of the classes, the classes really came from questions that come from you. And understanding the stitch regulator, I think, is a really important one for all of us new or seasoned quilters to um, have a better understanding of what the stitch regulator does. And a couple things about the stitch regulator. Um, it has components to it. And in the Tin Lizzie machine, the stitch regulator is built in. Now, there are some machines where the stitch regulator is not built in the machine, or stitch regulator can be added to the machine at a later date. With Tin Lizzie machines, it's built into the machine. And they have a few older models, the very first original Tin Lizzy that um, was 95 pounds. There was a stitch regulator that could be added to some of the versions of that. But now these days, the stitch regulators are on the machine. And so during this webinar, I'm going to show you how to test your stitch regulator if your stitches aren't doing exactly what you think they should do. We're going to talk about the encoders and visually look at encoders and see what exactly they do. So you really are going to learn a lot about what the stitch regulator has to offer. And I'm glad that you haven't missed this class. So what is a stitch regulator? It's really a tool on your machine. Now there are some people that would say, I never want to use a stitch regulator. There are other people that couldn't live without their stitch regulator. And so you'll come accustomed to either really liking your stitch regulator or having the ability to shut it off. But it is a tool, it's an instrument for you to use when you're quilting. And we'll talk about when you might stitch without a stitch regulator or when you might um, change things with your stitch regulator. We're also going to talk about the X and Y movement. That's the movement that and the wheels, called the encoders, to create the stitch. The encoders control the needle movement. So if you've ever stitched and your needle skips stitches or the needle drags in the fabric, that really has to do with your stitch regulator and not necessarily your machine. Although you could get skip stitches from an old needle, you could get skip stitches from your take-up rail being too far off of the bed of the machine and you having bounce in your fabric. That will cause skip stitches. But the drag of the needle is usually the stitch regulator. And so it's really important for us to have a better understanding of the stitch regulator. So the job of the stitch regulator is to get us accurate stitches. And how do we get those accurate stitches? Well, there's a few things that we're going to want to do when we free motion quilt and when we use our stitch regulator, even with a robotic system. You want to be smooth. So if you're using a robotic system, you probably see that the stitch regulator, excuse me, works very well because You don't want to go from a parked position, okay, a parked position. So think about this. You go to the store and you go to the parking lot. And when you're in the parking lot, you leave your parking spot. You don't put your foot to the gas pedal full speed leaving the parking lot. You have to kind of ease in to the speed that you're going to get to. A stitch regulator works the same way. It has what's called ramp up speed. And you literally need to get the machine speed to the speed that you need it to be before you go full speed. Now, when I quilt, I quilt with music. You need to find your rhythm. You need to find what relaxes you. That's extremely important. So for those of you that have free motion and are trying to learn your stitch regulator, in that chat box, what is it you do to relax? What is it you do 
to get a smooth movement with your machine. And I'm going to wait before changing my slide to see what your answers are. So great information. Some people say they just have to get in the zone. Some people always listen to music. Um, some people get a massage before they free motion. I like that idea. I like Christy. She says she watches Jurassic Park. That's like really intense music and, you know, you're getting really deep into thought with what you're doing. So you guys have some great ways to relax. That is extremely important. Some people have a glass of wine or something to drink that relaxes them. Breathing exercises. There are all different ways that we can relax before we free motion. Because what tends to happen is we tense up. And then it's not really the machine's fault that we have issues. It's sometimes us tensing up. And sometimes it's the machine in the stitch regulator, but we're going to walk through those things today. So what is a stitch regulator? Again, it's a tool. Now, these are answers from eHow. I took them right from their website, and they're very accurate answers. And it is a tool. And, you know, many quilters in the beginning had no stitch regulator, so they've come accustomed to free motion quilting without the stitch regulator. And they became the regulator. There's nothing wrong with that. It's okay. You may find you like the stitch regulator, or you may find you don't. Most, not all, most robotic systems need a stitch regulator for it to work. Vicki has a really good suggestion. She says she practices the design by drawing it several times on a dry erase board. And I do that on my grid. I have a quilter's grid that's a piece of plastic. And I also do the same thing. I put it on the quilter's grid and draw it out a lot. That gets your brain trained in the way you're going to move. Now, with the stitch regulator, a couple things you should know. You have adjustability. You have adjustability in the size or the length of your stitches. Now, some machines will say you get 10, 12, however many stitches per inch. It's really a fine line that if you measured that, would it be exactly that? So what you want to do is you want to get the length to look the look you're looking for. So a heavier thread, you might want a longer length with your stitch regulator. A lighter weight thread, you might want a shorter length with your stitch regulator. So um, Pamela is asking, what is my favorite stitch length? It's going to vary with my thread. So if I'm quilting with a silk thread, which I have and I do, it's a very small stitch. If I'm quilting with a heavyweight thread, 12 weight, it's a very long, and not you know huge long, but a longer stitch than normal. I like a medium stitch um, on my Tim Lizzie that I have here. I usually keep it between 12 and 14 stitches. I like a smaller stitch than I do a longer stitch. And that's using a 30 weight thread, 30 or 40 weight thread. So typically, you're going to want to practice ahead of time to verify your stitch regulators working, you like the stitch length with your thread, and everything looks good with your tension. Now, benefits of a, a stitch regulator, there are different people that say there are benefits and not. So, again, these are just um, suggestions of what the benefit of a stitch regulator could be. You're going to get the consistency. You're going to get the look of an even stitch. Can you override the stitch regulator? A few people are asking that. Yes, you can. So being smooth, getting the rhythm down, is going to become extremely important, okay? So that's something that you really want 
to make sure that you understand that you can override it, meaning if you leave that parking spot with your foot on the gas, so you grab a hold of your handles of your machine, and you move full speed out, you're going to have either really long stitches at one point and then very short stitches. So you want to get the ramp up speed of the machine going at one time. Now, I'm in front of uh, the Ansley ESP. So I have a monitor. It's not necessarily is it a robot, but it can be a robot, but it's the stitch regulator. You may have handlebars on your machine. And so if you have questions about your specific handlebars, let me know because I do know some of the differences between the Tin Lizzie models. I have a couple um, different versions that I've had over the years. And so I might be able to help you with some of the questions you have. On your machine, you have a manual mode which I don't think is really the best name for it because people think manual is free motion, which it is. But manual mode on your machine is actually non-regulated mode. No stitch regulator is on when you put your machine into manual mode. So some of you will push a digital button. Some of you push a mechanical button to move from manual to stitch regulated mode. If you have a stitch regulator, you have a stitch regulator on and a stitch regulator off, being the manual mode. If you have the manual mode, you also would want to wind your bobbin in the manual mode because then you do not need to move your machine around. Remove the thread out of the needle and secure it and then put it in manual mode and wind your bobbin. That's also a good time to oil your machine. So you can even unthread your machine to do that. But it's a great way to uh, wind your bobbin to be in manual mode. Manual mode is also a great mode to be in for thread painting. You want longer and shorter stitches. You want stitches that don't look the same. Then you'll want to be in manual mode. And then you control that stitch by moving faster and slower, getting longer and shorter stitches. Now, some machines have an idle mode. And an idle mode is a mode that is stitch regulator. Sometimes it's used with robotics. And it has a locking stitch. So it will pause at the beginning and at the end, locking. And if the machine is not moving, depending on the machine you have, it will time out and not shut the machine off, but shut the needle movement off. So that's an idle mode. Some machines have a ruler mode or a lizzy mode. And what happens with a ruler mode is the needle does not move until you move. So if you are in ruler mode, you're going to do a slow movement at the beginning, kind of like our parking lot description. And then you're going to move in your regular mode. Why the needle doesn't move is so that if you need to reposition that ruler, you can do that without the machine making a lot of stitches in one spot. For those of you that don't have a ruler mode and you want to stitch with rulers, you'll stop your machine with the needle down. And I always like to stop at my needle down position and then move your ruler. Then there is a basting stitch on some machines. If you don't have a basting stitch, we'll get to you in just a moment. But a basting stitch is an automatic, very long stitch. You touch base, and it stitches a very long stitch. It is a regulated mode because that long stitch stays consistent as you move the machine across. So keep in mind that the Stitch may be long, but it's still regulated. And in all of these but the manual mode, and depending on the machine you're on, the machine will time out when it's not moving. So if you turn your machine on and the machine doesn't move, the machine will automatically go to timeout mode, and then you'll have to restart the start button on your machine. 
If you want a long basting stitch and you don't have the basting stitch mode, you have two options. You can lengthen your stitch length to the longest length that you have. Or what I tend to do is use a water-soluble bobbin thread that will wash away when I wash or rinse my quilt out to block it. And that water-soluble bobbin thread only needs to be in the bobbin, not the top. That also allows me to regulate my stitch length and check to see that my stitch length is where I need it to be. Anne says, on her machine, it seems that the length of the basting stitch depends on the speed of the movement of the machine. If you are jerky, that is true, Anne. And so when we go to the screen, if you have the ESP, I'm going to go to the screen. I'll show you the different modes inside of that stitch regulator monitor. Again, it's not the robotic side of it. It's just the stitch regulator monitor. Now, I know that there are some people on here with an empress. They're going to turn the dial to make their stitch longer or use the basting thread. They have a toggle switch that will toggle from stitch regulated mode to non-stitch regulated mode. Then there are some of you that have the LS and you have the two handlebar controls. So you have a Lizzie mode or you have a manual mode. So those are the differences between the um, different models. So if you have a different one, let me know and I can help you with that. Anita says that she has the ram and she uses the needle up and down to base. And you can do that or you can set that stitch length to a very long stitch, Anita, or you could use the water-soluble bobbin thread. So again, there's quite a few ways to um, do the basting and you're going to find what works best for you. So there are different modes, and we're going to go into the machine here and just view the monitor here in just a little bit. So you see the Lizzie, the idle, the based, and the manual. Again, you may just have a manual and an idle, and you didn't know the names of them, or you may have a manual and a Lizzie. So they're all a little different. Debbie said that she has the um, Tin Lizzie LS and the Lizzie mode and manual mode, but she heard there is another mode. And there is another mode, Debbie, so I was waiting to see if somebody asked that. So listen up. Anybody that has a Tin Lizzy LS, you actually have three modes. And you have an idle mode and you have a ruler mode. The mode that you do not know about or, or have heard about and don't know how to do it, when you flip your machine on, only when you turn it on, if you want to go in the other mode, you'll hold the auto stitch button or Lizzie stitch button, depending on which one you have, while turning the machine on, and you'll hear three long beeps. When you hear those three long beeps and the last beep doesn't shut off, you let go of that button, and then what happens is it cycles through a couple more beeps and then you're ready to go. So you do also have a ruler mode and a Lizzie mode with that. Good questions. I want you to know that in the user's guide there is very detailed instructions for the stitch regulator. And if you don't know where your user's guide is, the great thing is on the Tin Lizzie site, they have all the manuals and the user's guides on the site. So be sure to check that out, that there is a lot of great information on their website for that. And when we go to the video here in a moment, you're going to see movement. And I'm going to walk you through how things move and how things change and um, how the needle moves with the encoder. I'm actually going to put the camera right down by the encoder so that you can see it move. What you need to know on your machine and frame is this. When you move left to right, that's testing the X encoder. And that X encoder is in the back of the machine. 
it's underneath your carriage. So it's not the easiest one to see or the easiest one to get to. And sometimes you need someone to help you with this. But there are two encoders. So the back one on the back of the frame under the carriage is your X. Your Y is the one on the side of the frame. It's on the upper carriage, attached to the upper carriage, rolling on your lower carriage. Or it's attached to the machine, depending on which model, again, you have. So when I say the X encoder, we're talking about the back. When I say the Y, we're talking about the side. If you're having stitches that aren't what you think they should be, there is a way to test the encoder and test your stitch regulator. So I'm going to walk you through testing the stitch regulator and showing you how things work. If you want to test your stitch regulator, you actually do not need any thread. You don't need um, anything on the top of the machine, and you'll be able to test it. Now, if you want to look at the stitches, you will want some thread and a bobbin in your machine. But just testing the stitch regulator, you'll get accustomed to just doing it without fabric and thread, and it's a movement, and you'll be able to see. But sometimes we want to see that needle move, and so when you do, then just put some muslin or some fabric on there. You don't even need batting or anything. You're just testing movement and that needle, although you could have something that you're playing with free motion also. I'm just reading a couple questions. So um, one of the questions here by Debbie is, so what is the ruler mode used for? The ruler mode is actually used to use rulers. So let's just say you were going to stitch in the ditch. And just so you guys know, I'm not stitching the ditch. I stitch in the neighborhood because I never hit the ditch. And if I wanted to stitch in the ditch or the neighborhood, I could use a ruler with a ruler foot and follow a straight line in that ditch or make curves or maybe make circles or scallops and things. So a ruler mode is a mode for free motion. It is something that if you had the robotics, you could record with that also. So depending on what you're doing, let's say you needed a 45 degree line on a quilt you were doing. You could record that 45 degree line with the ruler and then have that line saved in your robotic. Now the stitch regulator is part of the machine. So we've got a couple people asking about that. If you have the robotics, it's really not part of the robotics. So let me explain the difference because this is where the questions come in. A robotic system is actually attached to the carriages of the frame and to your frame. So it moves the machine. It's kind of like a GPS for your sewing machine. It's going to move the machine left to right, forward to backward, any direction it needs to go. The stitch regulator is part of the machine. And it works with your robotics off or on. It's its own separate component of the machine. So those are really, really good questions. Now, why would you need to test your stitch regulator? I think it's important for you guys to know this. And we've talked about how we're going to do it with the X and Y. But maybe your needle's dragging in the fabric. Okay? That would be one reason to test to figure out your stitch regulator. Another one is you're getting long stitches periodically. Or the stitch quality is not what you think it would be or should be. And it's not tension related. Maybe it has to do with something else. So that's really checking the tension. I mean, checking the, the stitch regulator. Tension is an entirely different uh, entity. It's a different function. So you have these little black encoders. And I have some here I'm going to show you in just a little bit. But you have these encoders. And these are attached to the frame and machine, the carriage. So depending on what you have, it's usually attached to the carriages and the machine. Um, base on the Phoenix frame. It's an upper carriage, but it's the base for the machine. 
the very first thing that I would say to you is you want to manage the cords for your encoders. If those cords are not managed, they're going to get caught, and depending on which Tim Lizzie you have, they might move the encoders off of the carriage. So I'm going to show you when we take the camera down that I have zip ties and strain release pads on my encoders. And you must have a free movement. So that means I should be able to move my machine forward and backward, left and right, without those cords moving the encoders. That's really important. You want the encoders dust free. And when I say dust free, here's why. Think of this. You have a dust bunny that fell on your frame. The encoder rolls over that dust bunny. You're going to get a long stitch where that happens. You do not ever oil your encoders. There is a small circular computer board inside of the encoders, and it's a costly error to oil your encoders. Okay. And then these black rings on the encoders, these little rings right here, I would suggest that you go to the local hardware store and get some of these to have in stock, especially if you're in a dry climate. Those are O-rings, and depending on the encoder you have, they might be a size 10 or a size 17, but take one of those to the local hardware store, and you'll want backup of those O-rings. So in my drawer here in a little bag, I have extra O-rings. And those O-rings are what help it to ride the frame correctly. Now, not all encoders have O-rings. The white Phoenix encoders do not have these little rings. Yep, so Pamela says hers are white. So you won't have the O-rings. So um, they're usually on the black encoders. Now, a couple of you have held the cords in place with tape. So I'll show you how to do it with the zip ties. It's a better um, way to hold the um, cords is with the uh, strain release pads and the zip ties. And Pamela, you don't want to think that it's a bummer not having the black encoders. Your encoders have a spring in them that holds them down. The black encoders do not. So there's a couple differences between the encoders. So the best way to clean the encoders, um, on the white ones, your wheels on the white ones get a little dirty. And I use a dry microfiber cloth. I don't ever clean it with anything wet. I'm not worried about the black line that forms on that little encoder. You'll see it when I take the camera there, what that looks like in just a little bit. And Anita wonders what she can do to stop the black from coming off the encoders on the rails. It depends on um, why the black is coming off. Uh, sometimes it comes off and I don't know what you've done in the past, um, Anita, but sometimes it comes off from what we've cleaned them with. Sometimes it comes off from our environment, and we just have to change the O-ring. So it depends on, um, you know, what you've done um, in the past, and it may be, again, just replacing those O-rings. It may be nothing that you've done. You can use canned air. So here it says canned air. Most definitely, microfiber cloth. I also have one of those mini vac attachments. I use that all the time. Here's why. I took everything out of my sewing room a couple months ago and cleaned it. I hadn't done that in 15 years. And the dust bunnies that had formed in the corners, I decided that the canned air was not the best for my room because it just blows all over the place. So instead, I take the vacuum cleaner and take it out of my room. It's much better for me. Um, so you have two encoders, X and Y. I know you know which one X is. The back goes left to right. The Y, the side, goes forward to backward. These have a cable that connects to them right here. You want to be careful with that cable and this connection here 
because you don't want to crush this plastic piece. So, you know, just be real careful when you're uh, working with your encoders and things. Now, we're going to go to the frame here, and you guys have had a lot of great questions, so I appreciate um, you asking the questions, and I want you to keep continuing to ask them when we go to the frame. And I'm going to move the camera around when we go to the frame to a couple different locations just so that you can see uh, the encoders. But first, we're going to look at the stitch regulator. So again, mine might look different than yours because I'm on the Ansley 26 ESP. But the concept is going to be the same for most all of the Tim Lizzie. Here, I have a Lizzie mouse and it goes to a basting stitch mode. I can touch it, and it goes to an idle mode, and I can touch it, and it goes to manual mode. So we're going to start at the manual mode. Manual mode, this is a really good visual, even if you don't have that one, this, this particular model, there is no stitch length. I want you to notice that. Manual mode, there is no stitch length, okay? So that's important. You are the stitch length. So if we're going to do manual mode, okay, the needle is going to constantly move. Do a couple things with this. Okay, so when I push the belt button, it's going very, very fast. You can probably hear it. Now, I can slow that machine down, the needle down, with the touch of a button. That becomes extremely important. So when you want to slow the machine down, you want to do that with the speed of the needle, okay? You may have a dial that you turn that's your stitch length. You may have a stitch length that uh, you can adjust by pushing an arrow up button or an arrow down button. So depending on what you're doing, you can change your speed of your needle. And you'll also adjust that by how fast or how slow you move the machine. Give me just a moment. My camera on my video projector is taking pictures for us. Okay, so that's manual mode. The next mode that we have is Lizzie mode. This is a stitch regulated mode. So when I push the start on the machine, it's on right now, but you don't hear the needle moving until I move the machine. Okay, so keep in mind that that needle does not move till I move the machine. That's your ruler mode. That's important to know that that's your ruler mode. The next mode we have, notice we have a stitch length with this one too. So right now stitch length is set at 10. The next one is based. Notice three very long stitches. So you can adjust that. Somebody had asked, how do I adjust the stitch length? There you go. You should be able to see it now. How do I adjust the stitch length? Okay. So base is 3. Idle is 12. And these can be programmed in this particular machine. Manual, no stitch length. Lizzie, 10. Yep, you can adjust the stitch length on your RAM also. Yep, 
So um, keep in mind, you do have a maximum and a minimum. So if I go to the minus 2, 1, is the is the highest number we can get. One is the lowest number that we can get. When is it on 10? Well, mine is programmed to be set at 10, but I can adjust that. 10 would be for a very fine thread. It's a, um, a shorter stitch length. Let's see. Ten stitches per is for a heavier weight thread. I have to I have to do it to remember which way it is. So shorter stitch for ten. Sherry would like me to review how to get to the um, the other mode in the Tim Lizzy LS stitch regulated mode. What you're going to do, and I can do a little video of this and put it on my blog also. What you're going to do is you're going to hold the Lizzie stitch button, auto stitch button, depending on the model that you have, when you turn your machine on. You'll get three long beats. When you get to the third long beat, you're going to let go, and then the machine will beat some more, and cycle through to go into your other mode. So there are a couple different modes. Now I'm going to move the camera so that you can see the encoder. We've got a couple questions coming in. So yes, you can adjust the stitch length up or down depending on what you're doing. And I do that on a practice piece on the side normally. So um, depending on what you're doing, if you've changed your weight of thread, you'll want to check your tension anyways. If you've changed your bobbin, you'll want to check that also. So definitely you can change your stitch length uh, to different lengths. So now you can see the side of the machine. And with this, does, does your machine have encoders? The answer is yes if you have a stitch regulator. So what you'll see is as I move this, that encoder is also going to move. This is the encoder here. I can lift it up, and on this particular model, it snaps back down. Notice this cord does not go anywhere. That cord is in place with zip ties and strain release pads. Now, some of you are asking what um, are zip ties and strain release pads. So I'm going to show you how I hook those all up with my little zip ties I have here and stuff and hold things in place. And a zip tie... I couldn't live without them in my sewing room. I use them for lots of different things in lots of different ways. Now, a couple people have asked, with the different modes, does that have to do with the robotics? It doesn't have to do with robotics. It has to do with the different modes of different people's sewing machines. So you may have an Empress, a DLS, an LS, an original Tin Lizzy. You may have an ESP. There are quite a few models to choose from, or you could have the RAM. So each of those has a different way to get to things. So this is a clean release pad and a zip tie holder. And that's what I use to put things where they need to stay on the frame. And so with that, it becomes extremely important on how I place those, where I place those, where I um, want those cords to stay without getting in my way. And so I 
often, you know, very often, am checking my cords and making sure that everything's the way that it needs to be. So if you if I move the machine and you look up here, you'll see that there's a zip tie holder holding that cord where it is. And as I move the machine back and forth, those cords are not getting stuck on anything. They're not impeding in my machine movement. And that becomes extremely important. As soon as, especially with the black end coders, the encoder lifts up and you no longer have a nice long stitch length. Pamela is asking if the black line on my encoder, so where the encoder is riding on my skirt, is that at the center of my rail, and it is not. That the pressure on that encoder is more to the arm of the encoder. And when I uh, pull one up here, I can uh, show you what that looks like. So I'm going to pull out some encoders here. You can type in a few questions. I'm going to move the camera, and then I'm going to show you what encoders look like and how they function. Okay, have, I want a nice backdrop here so that you can see the encoders. So these are what encoders look like. They're literally white or black usually. They're little wheels. So I can roll this, this wheel turns. Now, what you want to do is you want to take some white out, some painter's tape. You want something so that you can see when that roller Whiteout works very well for that purpose. Of course, I don't have any whiteout, but I'm going to put this on it so that you can see what I mean. That, it, so that, that encoder, if you can't tell if it's moving, you've got to visually do something to see that it's moving. And so for demonstration purposes, I'm just going to put a piece of painter's tape on it with a line and a marker that it's moving. And that's the way you watch your encoders. That's why I was saying you might need somebody else to help you with this to see that things are working. So I'm drawing an arrow on black um, with a black sharpie. Okay. And here's the encoder. You can see it moving. So a piece of tape, white out. On the white ones, you could draw with a Sharpie marker if it didn't bother you, or you could put a piece of tape. But you need to make sure that those are moving 
in order for you to be able to know that that encoder is functioning. If the encoder doesn't move, you are not going to get correct stitches. So some of you are wondering about the sound. The sound can be a couple different things. It can be the internet connection. I actually am wearing a headset, so the microphone is always with me. So I apologize for any sound issues, but sometimes it's my internet connection or yours. And when we do video, it's streamlined. And so that's really important to know that streamlined video, you have that when you're doing internet classes. Okay. So a couple of you have asked, how do you take the, uh, the little rings off the encoder? So I'll show you that. They pop off. You can roll them in your hand. So I've rolled it, and you just take this little circle to the hardware store. And uh, the local hardware store right here by my house has a drawer, and I just let them know how many I need. Each of my encoders on uh, my Tin Lizzy uh, LS, they take four of these black wheels. On the Empress, it takes four of the same black wheels. So depending on which one you have, just take one of your wheels off, one of your rubber uh, O-rings off, and take it up to your local hardware store. So let me show you how to take that off again. So here's the encoder. You can slide it off with your hand. Be careful not to stick anything sharp in there because you will cut the ring. And there's the ring. Pamela would like to know if the white cap can be replaced. Are you talking the white cap on the wheel of your encoder, Pamela? Any part of the encoder can be replaced, and it may be just purchasing a new encoder to be able to do that. Now, on the white um, encoder, I'm looking here. Yeah, the rubber piece does come off. I'll have to check on that. I don't know. I've never had to replace them, but it's a good question, and we can find out the answer to that and let you know, Pamela. So what I want you to see next is we're going to um, talk about going back and forth and forward to back. So if we were testing our stitch regulator, and we had inconsistent stitches. Here's what you're going to do. And again, you can do this with fabric or without. You do need a needle in. And what you're going to do is put it in stitch regulated mode so you can't see up here. But let me move the camera so you can see. We're in stitch regulated mode. And what you want to do is you want to watch the needle. So I'm just going to put this back down to the needle so that you can see it. properly, it doesn't stitch. So what you want to do is test forward to backward and left to right. Forward to backward, test the side encoder. Left to right, test the X, the back encoder. And that will help you to figure out which one is not working correctly. Now I'm going to pause here to see what questions uh, we have. A couple of you are asking about the white O-ring, so we'll check on that.
So Bonnie's asking, if the encoder is not moving smoothly, what do you need to do? Well, the very first thing you need to do is you need to determine which one. And then once you determine which one, you need to mark the encoder so you see if it's rolling or not. And usually, if it's not rolling, it's usually only in one place. So it's somewhere where it's not hitting the frame correctly. It's not rolling on the frame correctly. So you need to check that. Then the next thing is, if it's rolling correctly in that space, you need to check your connections. You do not want to play with the encoder connections or the handlebar connections on your machine with the machine on. So you'll want to shut the machine off, check the connection cable to the back of your machine, and check the connection cable to the encoder. And that's really important to make sure your machine is off when you do that because you don't want to harm any of your computer components for that. I um, had my LS set up and didn't realize that the cord had loosened in the back of the machine, and it would be infrequent. Sometimes I'd have good stitches, and sometimes I wouldn't. And what I found was that that cord wasn't staying in as well as I would have liked it to. So I actually zip-tied the cord in place in order to keep it in that slot. If the encoder is not moving smoothly, you have a couple things that might happen. And, um, Bonnie, I believe, was asking that question. The first thing is the screw that holds the encoder to the carriage may be too tight. If you have a black encoder, you want the screw that attaches the encoder to the carriage to be loose enough but tight enough that you pick the encoder up and it drops back down to the frame. You don't want that screw to be so tight that the encoder stays in the air. There's a happy medium to that. So finding that becomes very important and using the washers and things that came with your encoder in order is important on how that lies also. Anita says every now and then the plug comes out of the encoder and she would like to know what she can do to stop that. Well, a couple things. On your stitch regulator, you could put a strain release pad on the side of the arm of the encoder in order to keep that plug in place with a small zip tie. The big thing to keep in mind if you need to do that is make sure you have a small amount of slack so that you're not pulling on that cord in that. And it may be a case of that you need a new encoder or it may be a case that you need a new cord because it should always stay in there. It should pop in and lock in. Um, they're not something that come out very easily. So I'm not sure which one it is, Anita, whether the cable end is not working correctly or the encoder end is not working correctly. Some machines you can, so this is a good question. Can you change your stitch length um, while you're stitching? There are some machines that Tim Lizzie have made that you can adjust the stitch length while you're stitching. So depending on which model you have, the LS, the um, all of the ESPs, the Empress, those models you can change the stitch length as you're going. When you get into the DLS models, the models that are digital on the handlebars, those models, you will stop the needle from moving, stop the stitch regulator in the machine, not turning it off, adjust your stitch, and then readjust your stitch length. So depending on the machine, and depending on, um, some people have add-on RAM handles on here, and some people have the RAM. Depending on that model, some of those can change while you're moving, and some you'll need to stop.
uh, Anita would like to know what model is the RAM. The RAM is its own model. It's called the RAM. There are RAM, RAM handlebars that have been added to some of the machines, but there is a machine specifically called the RAM, and that came out after the Empress. Lots of good questions. Well, the goal here was to help you to better understand your stitch regulator and, and really the ins and outs of the stitch regulator. Because without those pretty stitches and without the nice quilting that's happening, you know, we're, we're not in good shape. And so with a better understanding of that stitch regulator, it really helps us to be a better quilter and also helps us to uh, understand our machine. And that's the whole goal here is to help you to understand the machine. Now the last few minutes here, just a few questions for all of you. Are there things that you would like to see in the future? Them listed on the Tin Lizzie website and we're adding more and we're adding different times. So if there are specific things that you would like to see, we need to know. And I know a couple of you have asked for edge-to-edge um, -edge classes and um, different things. So we can add those. So Carolyn would like to see panographs, and we can do that. And uh, We talked about this a little bit last week on our webinar, that panographs are paper patterns. So we can do a lot with the panographs, showing you how to um, utilize them, how to record them if you have a robotic system, how to line them up, um, how to do a border with a corner if you have a panograph with those, so definitely. And we can do ruler work, and I um, need to get an extension table for my machine to be able to do the ruler work. I do not have an extension table for the Ansley yet, but I can get an extension table, and we can definitely teach ruler work. Bonnie's asking, in the Lizzie stitch, what causes the needle to stay down and not move when you first start stitching? It has to do, that is exactly the stitch regulator. So something in your stitch regulator is not connecting when you first start. So the needle is staying down. So you want to check uh, your roller. Now, try to move left or right or try to move forward and backward and see what happens with that. But that is definitely a stitch regulator um, issue that has come up for you. If the needle's not moving, it's the regulator. Well, I want to thank everybody for joining us today, and I appreciate you taking your time out of your day and your busy schedule and learning more about your Tim Lizzie.